And uh, if you could turn to Genesis, bear sheet 32. Genesis chapter 32, let's begin. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Yaakov said... When, when Yaakov saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, uh, which is, uh, it's two, what's it mean? Two camps, if I remember right? Yeah, two camps. So let's assume that there's two angels that met him there, which is why he said there's two camps of God. Uh, then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. All right, so let me give you a little background. Uh, how many are reading your, your Bibles every week, by the way? Okay, wow, that's great. That's great, fantastic. You should be in the Word every single day preparing for this because there's no way I'm going to be able to go through all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Scriptures that, that we go through uh, on our private time. There's just no way. It would take four or five hours to unpack uh, just the Torah portion itself, uh, much less the, the half Torah and the, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament readings. Uh, but today we're just going to focus literally on one single chapter and see if we can't uh, pull something out of here that might be uh, significant as far as the Scripture is concerned and your life is concerned. So come and be ready uh, to get into the Word of God. All right, so backstory here is uh, Jacob. Uh, he, remember, he, he takes advantage of his brother Esau way back in the story and uh, steals the birthright, right? And uh, Jacob is just a guy that just is constantly wrestling uh, with people, is he not? He's constantly manipulating, constantly deceiving, constantly doing whatever it takes to, to get uh, on top. Matter of fact, in today's world, he'd be called a company man. He, he's he's the, the guy that climbs the corporate ladder. He'll do whatever it takes, step on whoever he needs to, to get to the top. And so he ends up taking advantage of his brother. Mom says, you need to go out, uh, out west. And so he takes off and he goes and he finds himself with, uh, with Laban. Falls in love with Rachel. And uh, Rachel uh, ends up not being his first wife. He gets tricked. The tricker gets tricked. And, uh, and then later comes the treat. But uh, he ends up with Leah. Then he ends up with Leech, uh, Rachel. And then ends up with their two uh, maid servants. And so, I don't know about you, but having four wives would be give you a headache uh, every single day. Uh, but what would be worse is if a woman had four husbands. Uh, it would give her more of a headache, Right? My wife always says that. She says, Jim, uh, you know, uh, what's up with this four wives thing? If, if, if women could have husbands, we could actually get something done around the house. You know. <laughs> but in any case, I digress. We'll continue on. All right, so we come to the point where he's leaving Laban. And he, last week's tour portion was when he tricked Laban and said, hey, I'm going to uh, give you all of the perfect, beautiful pure sheep and goats, thank you, Jim, and, uh, and you can have, uh, and I'm going to take all of the speckled and the spotted and all the, the weak ones. And Jacob had a plan, and his plan was to take these, these uh, trees and split the bark and make stripes and put them in the water, and when the sheep came to mate, they saw that, that shocked their system, and scientifically, chemically, it messed with them as they were, uh, as they were conceiving, and they bore spotted, speckled, and, and striped sheep and and he kept all the strongest ones. And so Jacob once again takes advantage. And now it's time for him to leave. He takes everything that he's got and he takes off. Uh, but he sees, uh, he wants to meet Esau. The problem is, is he discovers that Esau wants to meet him too. And the difference is Esau has 400 men with him. So Jacob, top of the line, you know, he's the gun and guy. He's the guy that knows everything. He's got it all under control. Cool, calm, and collected. Extremely wealthy by this point in his life. And now he's scared like a chicken from his older brother who's got 400 men. So it says in verse 7, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herd and the camels into two groups. So he divides them into two groups again. His only default is into his flesh. His only default is to scheme. His only default is to do what he can do best with his own two hands. 
And so he thinks, he's a very smart guy, and he decides, I'm going to divide my family into two groups, and that way if Esau kills one, he, he won't even know the other one exists, and my progeny will live on. So he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal with, well with you. He starts going into prayer and he says, I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I've become two groups. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he lodged there the same night, took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. And he gives him all these goats, all these camels, all these everything. And, uh, and, and he sets up all this stuff. So let's move to uh, verse 20. Also say, this, he's telling his, his commanders, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So Jacob is such a, 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 he's such a chicken. He sends one group ahead. And tells the head guy, by the way, when you see Esau, tell him that these are your gifts, uh, Jacob is behind us. Another group sends it up there, hey, these are your gifts, Jacob's behind us. And the next group comes up, he says, hey, these are gifts from Jacob, Jacob's behind us. Esau at some point is going to go, yeah, Jacob's way behind you, like 400 miles west near Kansas City probably. I'm starting to get the point here, this is a stall tactic for Jacob to run. How would you like to be the servants in charge of having to go to Esau and tell him this, right? The first one might get away with it. The third one, Esau's going, I'm not buying this. But in any case, watch this, verse 22. And he rose that night, took his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and his two female servants, and his 11 sons, because who hasn't been born yet? Benjamin. And crossed over the fort of Jabbok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was alone. So his whole family, his intimate family, uh, gets sent over by by themselves, and he stays, and he's alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. This is one of those strange stories in the Bible, don't you think? Jacob sends his 11 sons, his four wives over, takes a coffee break, and the man comes out of the bush and starts wrestling with him all night long. So now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, the angel's talking now, or this man, let's just say, he touched the socket of his hip, of Jacob's hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the angel said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name. And I I, I pray, or in Hebrew, tell me your name right now. And he said, why is it that you ask me about my name? Are you going to bless me? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of that place. Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Okay. For Jacob called the name of the place face of God, for I've seen God face to face. Now, now, time out, we've got a problem on our hands theologically because how many times does the scripture say that you cannot see God face to face? I'm an atheist. I ha- this is why I don't believe in God, because this is a clear contradiction of the Scriptures right here. Jacob sees God face to face, yet other places say no God can, nobody can see God face to face. Even Jesus himself says, nobody can see the face of God except for the, him who comes from God. So how does Jacob see the face of God? Is anybody, am I the only guy that asks this question as you're reading through this? Is that... A strange thing. 
Well, I'm going to suggest to you it's the reason why we're going through this, this whole concept of the Trinity on trial and the Godhead and understanding the nature of Yahweh or Elohim because we've been looking at the Scriptures from our Greco-Roman English mindset. So when I say face of God, what are you thinking? You instantly, okay, for right now, do not picture an elephant when I say elephant, okay? Stop thinking about the elephant. Don't picture an elephant. Especially do not picture a pink elephant with white spots. It's the worst kind of elephant. And don't let it into your living room. Okay, how many of you thought of the pink elephant with white spots, okay? You can't... What color is my shirt? Who said pink? Why are you both pointing at each other? The Russians. It's not possible if I ask you a question to not answer it in your mind, is it not? And so in the same way, when we say the face of God, you instantly, from your own perspective, are thinking of God as a person in His face. Right? Let's just be honest. So no man can see the face of God, and that's exactly what you're seeing. Yet Jacob says, I've seen the face of God, and I've lived. So I'm going to call it the face of God. But we are learning through the nature of God series that we're going through that not all names in English are exactly what they are in Hebrew because the word face, and actually what it is in the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's plural. It's panim, which is faces of God. That should actually make a lot more sense if you've made it through the first two parts of the series. It's the faces of God. It is the essence or the presence of God. I've been in the presence of God and I lived. But the face of God can emanate itself in multiple different formats. And in this case, we know from other scriptures, this is the angel of God that we've been studying for weeks now. This is the angel of God that appears in the form of a man, a physical man, human being. You can't wrestle with an angel. But he's wrestling with a real human being. It's a manifestation of the angel of God that it shows up. The same angel of God who is, who is what's called in scriptures the Lord of hosts. The commander of the heavenly armies. He shows up. And Jacob wrestles with him all night long. Now what's really interesting to me, I asked my kids this last night. Near daybreak, all of a sudden the angel just, says, just touches his hip. Bam, Jacob's done. I mean, that's the next question that I ask myself. What's up with this angel? I mean, if you're going to wrestle someone, why not pull the whole hip thing like five minutes into the wrestling match? Why wait, you know, eight hours later, right before dawn? There's a reason why. And why is it the hip anyway? Why not the neck? Why not the shoulder? Dislocated shoulder hurts. Why not just crush him and kill him? Just leave one eyeball open so you can speak to him, you know. But he doesn't. He, he, does, he refrains using his divine powers and pulls him out right at the last second. There's a reason for this. We'll come back to it in just a second. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel... Oh, he says, in verse 31, Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. He limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that, sh that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Did you know that there are many Native American Indian tribes today that do not eat the, the hip muscle of the deer? And uh, a friend of mine is a Cherokee, and he always wanted to know this, and so he did this big, long research and discovered that the Cherokee Indians were Hebrews. And if you go into Tennessee, you'll see a 700-foot-long uh, memorial in one of their caves, and the writing on their cave is ancient Paleo-Hebrew, because they were, uh, many of the Native Americans actually were the dispersed Israelites that came over to America. And... He found out that the reason, when he, when he did this three-month journey, true story, actually he was the great, 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 great grandson of Sitting Bull. I got to meet him. I was sitting right next to Sitting Bull. And uh, 
he went back to his chief of the Indian tribe and he said, Chief, this is what I've discovered. I discovered all these things that I discovered. This is why we don't eat the hip of the, of the deer is because of, of commemoration of Jacob wrestling with the angel and being touched by the hip and the Israelites did all this and so on and so forth. And the chief was just shaking his head. Interesting, interesting. And he finished his dialogue. It took him like 15 or 20 minutes just to unpack everything that he learned. He traveled to the United States about looking at his heritage. And the chief said, tell me something I do not know. And the great-grandson of Sidney Bull said, well, why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me travel the entire you know, planet, you know, Earth, to discover these things? You need to discover it on yourself. In many ways, I believe Yahweh is the same way. He says, you need to discover these things on your, on your own. You need to discover these things on your journey. Why did the angel wait to the very last minute? Because it's prophetic of what happened in Jacob's life. So let's back up and discuss this chapter real quick. We spent 15 minutes going through the chapter. Now let's open it up, open your eyes up to what's really happening. First of all, we go back over here into uh, verse um, 7. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two groups. What is Jacob's name going to be changed to? Israel. So Israel's people get divided into two groups. See the connection? All right, so Israel, made up of 12 tribes, is eventually going to get divided into two groups, the northern house of Israel and the southern house of Judah. Those two tribes are going to be split up. What is the purpose right here that Jacob says the reason why he, he is splitting up his groups? To ensure the survival of his people, right? Have you ever thought that maybe God is so ingenious that He divorces the northern kingdom of Israel on purpose to ensure, by hiding them in the earth realm, ensure the survival of His people? The enemy would have no access. Why? Because the identity would be lost. If the identity is lost, then Hasatan has no way to track them down. But as the identity comes back, the spiritual powers of the dark side begin to come back, which means God has to match that. This is why, if you ever wonder why it says in the end days that dreams and visions and everything will increase and the spiritual gifts will increase and prophecy will increase and miracles will increase. Why do you think it increases? Just because God's been, you know, hey, let's just... Let's do it now. Now's a good time. Flip a quarter. We finally got it on heads. Let's go, angel guys. Let's start doing miracles. No. It's because the identity of God's people begin to be unraveled in the earth realm, revealed in the earth realm, rather. And Hasatan, the enemy, sees that. And he goes after those, according to uh, Revelation 12 and 14, he goes after those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. So when the enemy begins to see the mark, if there's a thousand people in a room and one person has a yellow shirt, and Hasatan knows that the people with yellow shirt are dangerous to him, as long as he doesn't see a yellow shirt, he'll let people do whatever they want. But when he sees the yellow shirt, the spiritual starts to move and he starts attacking those people. So the angels that surround the righteous don't have a whole lot to do if the enemy's not attacking. But when the enemy starts to attack, the next thing you know, the only way to manifest in the spiritual realm to protect those people, grow those people, give them the spiritual strength that they need is to do dreams, vision, the, spirit, the spiritual gifts begin to increase. So if you have not seen the spiritual increase in your life, then maybe you're not wearing a yellow shirt. Maybe you should begin to wrestle with the Almighty. Speaking of wrestling with the Almighty, let's go back to the story. Let's pull a few more things out of here. So he touches the socket of his hip. My question is, why does he just wrestle with this guy all night long and all of a sudden he gets a new name? Is that all it takes? Wrestle with an angel and you get a new mission, a new name? Oh, you become the father of, of all the nations. Twelve tribes of Israel. And you get to be a patriarch on top of that. How is it that Jacob, just an eight-hour trip into a, into a wrestling match, gets this blessing that's off the charts that anybody in here would die to have? Because it has nothing to do with the wrestling. 
Nothing. How many times have I said that whatever happens in the physical, there's a spiritual message? Whatever happens in the spiritual, there's a physical manifestation. What is happening with Jacob wrestling with this angel is nothing to do with this moment. This is a physical manifestation of Jacob's entire life. The angel is trying to get Jacob to see what has already happened in the physical realm. Because listen, look what he says. He says, I'm going to change your name because you've wrestled with men and with God. We know when he wrestled with men, he wrestled with men his entire life. When did he wrestle with God? And when did he win? Because he won this wrestling match and it wasn't because of his mere strength at all. If you're in a wrestling match with God, who wins? Pretty rhetorical question. I, I just prefer not to get in the ring. But let's say that you are in a wrestling match with God. If you're wrestling with Yahweh, typically what are you wrestling? How many, how many of you felt like sometimes you're just wrestling with God? You're just wrestling with something in your life, man, right? When you're wrestling with something or struggling with something, typically that means that you are not doing what he's asked you to do and you're struggling with that. You're wrestling with doing the right thing or the wrong thing and the things that I want to do, I don't want to th- do and the things that I do want to do, I don't want to do. Romans chapter 7. What a wretched man that I am. So when you're struggling with God, when you're wrestling with God, typically it's because you're not doing, you're not trusting the Father enough to obey Him, right? This is the epitome of Jacob's life. He does not trust Yahweh enough to literally do what he said, just because Yahweh said so. He wants to do it on his own. Do you know anybody like that? I know every time I look myself in the mirror, I remind myself that I am Jacob. And it's not coincidence that my name is Jacob. James and Jacob are the same word in Hebrew. I tend to want to take things by myself and do things by myself. And when I'm $5 short, you know, I I want to just do it myself. We're in the middle of fundraising for for broadcast. I can't tell you how many times it's crossed my mind. Well, I could have done this in my past. I could have raised this money. I could have done this myself. Maybe I should just take a sabbatical and go start my business back up again and just fund the ministry since God's people are not standing up to the task. Or maybe it's just short and God just, you know, Lord, just let me handle this. I can do this. I can do it. And then right when his finger gets close to my hip, I say, okay, okay, okay. I understand. It's your deal. I'm not going to do this. I want you to go back with me to the time where Jacob wrestles. Well, actually, let me me ask the question so that you can answer it ahead of time. How do you stop wrestling with God? How do you win when you wrestle with God? There is a way, actually. And this is what this whole chapter is about. There's a way to wrestle with God and win, believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds. Because we know it. We see it. Jacob wins. How does he do it? What's that? What would you say? Very good. Are you a mind reader? It's his gift. He said, repent. Jacob wins because the first time in his life we see him humble himself. And this is where it happens in verse 10. This is where Jacob humbles himself. Jacob doesn't ever do this. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you've shown me, your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Jacob, his entire life has always been his guy. I mean, you're not going to find very many prayers from Jacob. Jacob's a guy that just takes the will in his own hands. Future, his hands. The world teaches that. You want something? Do it yourself. It's been most of my life, my motto. Instead of just sitting back and letting Yahweh do it. It's a lot less uh, stress, by the way, to do it that way. But it's at this point where Jacob repents, falls on his knees. And you know what? It's really sad. You know what it took for Jacob to get to this point? Fear of death. 
fear of death. Jacob, we finally found what Jacob's weakness was. It was his hip. You say, Jim, what do you mean? Well, you have to know a little bit about ancient uh, Israelite uh, culture to appreciate what's really happening in this wrestling match. Because the hip, this muscle is the strongest muscle in your body. This is called the thigh. This is the hip and the thigh. And the hip is connected to that very, very strong muscle of the leg. And that thigh in ancient Israel and that culture was a symbol of authority. And if you were the patriarch of a house and you gave an order to your servant, that person, or if they made a promise or an oath to you, they would take their hand and they would put it right up underneath the hip on the thigh. And they would make that oath and promise you. How many remember this happened in the Bible? Abraham and his servant, Eleazar. Abraham says, go get a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant puts his hand on the hip, on the thigh of Abraham, makes the oath and leaves by the authority of Abraham. So what happens is, Jacob has been his own authority his whole life. He's always been used to doing things his way. But finally he comes to a place where he realizes he needs help. He can't do this. He's not going to make this one out alive. His children are at risk. His beautiful, lovely, and most beloved wife, Rachel, is at risk. And his son, Joseph, and his other ten sons on top of that. His life is flashing before his eyes. He sends his, his children over across the river. And he stays there to beg for mercy from the Lord God. And it is at that moment where Jacob's hip was displaced. Before the angel touched it. The angel only touched and manifest what had already happened in the heart. Jacob broke in the wrestling match that he had been wrestling with God his whole life. And he won by repenting and admitting he needed help. The reason why the men of this congregation are so strong or getting stronger is because they're finally recognizing that they need help. Stop wrestling with God, ladies and gentlemen. Stop. And admit you can't do it. You can't. You can't be good enough. You can't keep the feast days good enough. You can't keep the Shabbat good enough. You can't love God good enough. It's not going to happen. So stop. And admit it. Humble yourself on this side of the river. And the family on the other side will be fine. When you stop taking measures into your own hands, and you step back and you let the Holy Spirit work in your life, He will not only come in. See, here's what happens in the physical realm. It says right here, Jacob walked with a limp the rest of his life. And I submit to you that he had never stood stronger or straighter. Because he gave up the authority in the physical realm, and he became the patriarch of Israel. He traded the authority of deception and taking matter to his own hands. He traded that to be the patriarch of Israel. He traded the sheep and the goats for the blessings of the Almighty. He traded having to figure it out himself for a, a spiritual recliner where he could just sit back and watch Yahweh do what he wants to do. So how many of you, let me just challenge you, how many of you are trying to figure it out? Trying to make ends meet? Trying to do this? Trying to do that? I can't afford to tithe. Can't afford to give. Can't afford to help this person. Can't afford to help my neighbor. Can't afford to even come to church. Can't afford to do this. Can't aff- I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray with my kids. I don't have time to, after Shabbat meal to go and, what do you mean you don't have time? You're Jacob. Stop wrestling with the Almighty. He sees the need. Obey Him out of your lack and watch Him open the windows of abundance. Let me say that again because some of you just don't understand what it means to obey Him from a place where you physically can't see how ends are going to meet. Obey Him. You don't have to see how it's going to meet. The world says you got to have this. you got to have that. 
you got to have this lined up, this lined up. It's, life is a bowling alley, according to the world. Every pin's got to be in its place. My God is that thing that comes down and wipes it all away. It's a strike every time, if you haven't noticed. If you read the user manual, you'll find out that when you pull up to the thing, the world says to keep hitting that ball every time. Don't get a gutter ball. I go up there. I say, okay, here's my ball. The world says, take it. I say, wait a minute. This don't feel right. I'm going to read the manual, make sure this is how I'm supposed to do it. I read the manual. The manual says, look down to your left, press white button, sit down. Press white button, strike. I sit down, give the Lord a high five. Silly example, but ladies and gentlemen, this is how we're supposed to live our life. So don't be Jacob. Be Israel. Let the Father change your life by you not changing a thing. I don't mean not changing the bad habits. I mean stop trying to change. You're not going to be able to change. Fall on your face and let Him change you. Because He's really good at doing it. I need changing. i got a lot of changing in my life. I still have a lot of dark areas I can't stand. Anybody can't stand areas in your own life? It's like you look yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh! You turn to your wife and say, honey, did you see egg on my face? And she says, I see the whole pan and the eggs and the bacon and the sausage. <laughs> you got toast falling out in your side of your ears. So God is good, isn't he? Yeah. One chapter, let's recognize that it's all prophetic about the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and it's prophetic about your life. Trust your king and fall down on your face. And by the way, Jacob never gets a name change if he doesn't make one single decision. He gets alone. He sends 11 Plus four, 15 people in his family. You think Saturday night is crazy at your house? 15 people. He sends everybody over there. He chooses to stay over here for one purpose. To bow the knee. How many of you have missed your destiny, life-changing mission because you didn't take the time to bow the knee? Wait for your angel. It's right in front of you. Let's pray.